Hello, hello, and welcome back to another exciting episode of What is a Biology? I'm your host as always, Mr. Johnny Hopkins, and today we're going to be covering something called genetic control. Specifically, we're going to be going into transcription factors, or as I uh, write them, TF. Uh, little TF, even though typically people write with an uppercase TF. So, what even is a transcription factor? That's what we're going to first do, and then we're going to go on to, you know, a little more about just like examples of transcription factors. Then, I'm going to talk about the uh, enhancers and the ways that uh, transcription, factor, transcription factors uh, bind to DNA, how we can find them experimentally, and just kind of like a genetic pattern on structure. What is a transcription factor? So, transcription factor is a protein, and it's a protein that uh, regulates the transcription of the gene. And so, typically, um, what some people can do, do is call any, any uh, DNA binding protein in, as a factor. So, it's a factor because it binds to DNA and it controls transcription. So, the transcription factor, there's two types of them. They are activators and repressors. Activators activate the transcription of the gene. Repressors repress the, acti the, uh, the gene being exposed. Uh, Happening. So if we want to stop thinking about applesauce, we just repress the gene that makes us think about applesauce all the time. So uh, one thing to remember is we're going to go into a specific example right uh, here is the operon. An operon is just a gene that encodes multiple different protein structures. So when something is needed, we have when some certain fu uh, functionality needs to be happening in the cell, we just call on this operon and it creates five different proteins that will help create a uh, environment so that we can do that cellular function. So one of these is the lac operon, which is very, very, very well known, which goes three different proteins. Um, and so these transcription factors, they actually bind usually um, in the promoter region. So this promoter region is about negative 10 to negative uh, 3, 35, sorry. Negative 10 to negative 35, so 10 to 35 um, base pairs up from the initiation site of the RNA polymerase. And so now, what is the lac operon? The lac operon essentially, what happens is, is when um, there's no lactose, we don't express the lactose, the uh, lac gene. When there's lactose and glucose present, we're only going to metabolize glucose because glucose is easy to digest. But when there's only lactose present and there's no glucose, then we need to metabolize the lactose, which means that we uh, establish the lac operon and promote its uh, occurrence. And so what this has done is that the operator, which um, happens in these operons, and so they actually overlap with the transcription site. So essentially, when there is no lactose, and with lac operon, there's no signal, so a repressor, a transcription factor will bind to the DNA and it will block and push away RNAP, it will push away the RNA polymerase so it does not bind and uh, we do not have these proteins being expressed needlessly. Now when there is lactose presence, the lactose will bind to the repressor and so it will bind to the repressor, it will make a conformational change in that repressor so it leaves the DNA so RNA polymerase can bind now so when we have when lactose is present, the DNA, the uh, transcription factor leaves, and so that RNA polymerase can uh, actually go on to DNA and start transcribing. But that's not usually what happens. It's just kind of it might do it here or there, but no matter what, just kind of it's not really going to happen that much, if at all. And what happens? What is needed is then when glucose is depleted then we have um, CAMP synthesized. So this is just a general cellular process. When there is no glucose, we generate CAMP, uh, cyclic um, adenosine monophosphate. So CAMP is synthesized, and that CAMP actually binds to a transcription factor called CAP, C-A-P. And that happens, um, so what happens is that the CAP, CAMP binds to the CAP, and there's a conformational change that happens in the CAP, so it's now activated, and so it will then bind to the DNA, where at the uh, side of the gene, and will promote the transcription of the lac operon, so it can digest lactose. So that's a little fun thing. And if you don't remember, uh, lactose is just a conjugate of glucose and uh, galactose, I believe. And so when those two are added, so essentially these three uh, genes, what happens is um, you have something that cleaves it in half, and 
metabolizes the glucose and metabolizes the uh, lactose. So that's what happens with the lactoferrin. So now just going back into a little more genetic structure type stuff is we have also something called an enhancer. And that is 80 to 160 base pairs upstream from the initiation site. And it can also be up to about 1,000 kilobases and just really far out there, but it helps activate transcription. And so one of these uh, things that happens is in bacteria, when you have an enhancer, there's one, in one specific instance, you have NRT, NTRC, uh, and the NTRB gene uh, proteins. And so NTRC is regulated by NTRB kinase. So this B is a kinase, and if you don't remember what kinase is, a kinase is just a protein that phosphorylates another protein. So essentially, it usually grabs the gamma phosphate off of ATP and sticks it onto a different protein. And what usually happens is you get a signal cascade and something happens. So just in this case, uh, so what happens is when there's uh, low glutamine, remember that good old amino acid? This is not galactose or glucose or any of those uh, ones. So when you have glu low glutamine, the uh, NTRB will phosphorylate NTRC then the NTRC is now activated, so it will bind upstream to the GLNA operator, the promoter, and then stimulates RAP, and then you have the GLNA being uh, promoted, so that means we have synthesis of glutamine, of GLN. Now, uh, and so this actually happens by binding to the enhancer. But um, uh, another example of just general, uh, transcription factors is this FOR and FOB, and these guys regulate the response of, uh, phos of phosphate, the concentration of phosphate. So essentially, um, FOR is um, a transmembrane protein, and um, you have uh, FOB, which is a side saw protein. So what essentially happens is that FOR will bind to uh, uh, FO, to, the, to PO4, to phosphate, and when um, it'll have a conformational change, and then the uh, phosphate will leave. And so what happens is that FOR then um, is activated because of its conformational change. So it will actually bind to FOB and take the um, gamma phosphate from ATP, send it off onto FOB, and um, that will cause conformational change. And then yeah, the FOB will then find its way to the nucleus, associate with the DNA, and uh, promote the transcription of genes that help with low phosphate concentrations. Because essentially when you have a high concentration of phosphate, phosphate will always be bound to the um, FOR. So you will not get that confirmation change. So that's the idea behind that one. So one thing to note is that there are many different types of repressors, and the one just kind of noted here is just one that sticks on the DNA and pushes away RNP, RNP. but there's also different types of ones, and one of them that we'll discuss uh, later on is um, something that actually causes the condensation of the cell of the um, cellular DNA itself. So it actually makes the genome just kind of condense, and so you will never have RAP actually enter that area ever, unless you haven't activated that. Don't know those, but in general, yeah, you kind of repress just condense the DNA so that never happens. And um, also, one thing to quickly note is that transcription factors can. Um, bind over around 10 kilobases away from the promoter and still uh, activate or repress the um, gene itself, which is pretty amazing when you just think of got something 10,000 miles away, but it's still affecting us, man. And um, thought it would take also be a good thing to quickly note of just we're talking about RNAP, but what RNAP? There are three different types of RNAP. There's RNAP 1, 2, and 3. One is in the nucleolus and it makes uh, pre-rRNA, makes ribosomal RNA. Number three makes uh, tRNA and synthesizes the uh, splicing RNA of the uh, signal recognition particle, the SRP. And then you have um, RNAP2, which is the one that we're actually talking about here, uh, for the most part. It, um, it makes pre-mRNA, pre -RNA, which is the RNA that, you know, makes proteins. And then it also actually makes some splicing proteins for this mRNA structure, for these mRNAs. So, now, continuing on, what, here's a little bit of uh, stuff about where the transcription factors spot. And you promote a region, one of the most common promoter regions is something called the Tata box. 
it's essentially T A T A T A T A. Uh, so then that's in the genetic code, and that's usually around negative 20, um, 25 to 35 base pairs upstream of the initiation site. And that's usually, these top top boxes usually provide very highly transcribed genes. And so this is a, a specific type of promoter that you'll hear again and again. There's also an initiator in eukaryotes, which has this little fancy, um, uh, it has this fancy structure. So it's got primidine, primidine, uh, a, any, um, any base, T or A, primidine, primidine, primidine. And what happens there is that's also another promoter. That's specific to carrots A, C, again and again, that is highly transcribed. And, um, but because of this, just remember that transcription can also be imprecise and that the RNAP can start anywhere from like negative to, uh, from 20 to 200 uh, base pairs away from the initiation site. So you usually have a different five prime for every single RNA. And that's just one thing to note down the line as well. And that's also just kind of a uh, thing of the impre imprecise nature of these promoters and enhancers and everything that the RNAP will just start kind of where it wants, but still gets the job done because the uh, main gene is also encoded in, gets sent over to the ribosome and gets made into the uh, proteins. Uh, one other part of the DNA is also something called promoter proximal element, which is around 100 to 200 base pairs away from the uh, initiation site. And you also have an, um, the distance of the enhancer can be 200 base pairs uh, upstream to over 10 kilo base pairs away with uh, eukaryotes. So this is all cool and everything, but how do we even know that these transcription factors really exist? Come on. You're telling me that these things exist in a cell, but you're not offering any way of like actually understanding these guys? Man, Mr. Johnny Hopkins, it's a, there's, a, there's a good reason you're not a master Mr. Johnny Hopkins yet. And the, well, the reason actually is that um, we can de actually detect these transcription factors by different assays and different experimental techniques. So the quickest, one quick and easy way is to, um, to determine transcription bi uh, binding, transcription factor binding to a gene is you take DNA uh, one footprint, and so it essentially just cleaves up the DNA, and when the DNA is protected by a transcription factor, when it's bound onto there, DNA eight, DNA one, it's not going to be able, to, you know, clip it off. It's got to run into t uh, the transcription factor. It's kind of, eh, it's too much work. And so then you run it into a gel, and then we get different fragments that are longer than the others. And you're like, oh, that's where a protein is bound because it didn't move as far and it's got that uh, transcription factor on it. You also have something that's quite similar, which is the electrophoretic um, mobility shift assay, the EMSA, which is essentially just a gel shift of the mobility of DNA. So essentially, when DNA is less bound, it will move further down the gel. When it is more bound by the transcription factors, it will move less. So you see that you do, you can see a um, shift in the band location, which means that the transcription factor has bound. Uh, in addition, you can also do sequence-specific DNA uh, affinity chromatography. You have DNA substrate, and then you have just drill, flow through some transcription factors with that specific DNA, and you can see that transcription factor binds to the DNA. Neat stuff. And one thing to also just remember is that you also have to worry about with a lot of different things is a constitutive expression. So essentially, you just have the cell constantly expressing a gene, and that's when you can activate a certain repressor. So there's just this um, protein just keeps getting made and made and made and made, but it's got no use, or it just um, happens to just cause some uh, developmental defects in the cells themselves, or it can just make leaky expression or something. Uh, it's just one thing you have to consistently worry about whenever you work, do stuff with prescription factors. And so, how do the, we know now that we know a way to tell how these uh, transcription factors bind to DNA? However, how does it do that? And it does it through these motifs, which I previously mentioned back a long time ago. And these motifs, uh, usually what happens is that there's a non covalent interaction between an alpha helix and the edge of the bases of the ma uh, major group of the DNA. Because if you remember, the DNA has a major and a minor group. So there are, in general, there are three ones I want to talk about for motifs that you'll actually see again and again. There are plenty of other motifs, but these are just the ones that you can be like, oh, I've heard of that. 
And so the first one is basic helix term helix, which I believe I covered previously. So essentially you have a helix, and then you have a turn right over where the um, DNA is, and then you have another alpha helix. And what happens is you have those interactions and hydrogen bonds with the base pairs as well as the backbone, usually uh, with a glycine. Uh, additionally, you have a coiled coil, which is just two alpha helices right next to each other. And you have this little hydrophobic patch right here, and then it combined to the DNA through uh, interactions with the alpha helices. And then you also have something called a zinc finger, which will come up uh, in a couple of units or something. Uh, so essentially, you have just this little motif where you have cysteine and cysteine and histine and histidine over over here, and these guys actually will bind onto a zinc. And so zinc is positively charged, and if you remember the DNA backbone, it's negatively charged because it's got a phosphate for every single base. And so that zinc will actually help anchor this guy to the membrane and help uh, with the electrostatic repulsion alongside just, um, and then it can make the interactions as well with alpha helices and with base pairs for a very specific um, base management. And so right here, these are just motifs. And one thing that actually happens a lot is that you have dimerization of either homodimerization or heterodimerization of these uh, proteins that cause them to bind. So that actually um, helps additionally with the specificity of these transcription factors and their affinities. So we're gonna just quick overview again. Transcription factor is a protein that binds to DNA and they can be activators or repressors. So essentially what happens is, is that there's some sort of a signal, the transcription factor gets activated, and it goes down and binds to the DNA, it grabs an RNA peak, and then the RNA peak will make a protein that is in response to the previous signal. There's also a repressor transcription factors that will go and bind to the DNA and push the RNA peak away and say, no, no, you cannot come here. Um, or they can also just <laughs> uh, really screw up the RNA peak and say, you will never come here and condense the DNA entirely. Uh, you know, different things will, and t uh, typically the transcription factors bind to the promoter region, or as well as the enhancer. And so there are different promoters, such as the top tunnel box and the initiator, and we can detect uh, transcription factors binding through just uh, gel assays, as well as um, um, chromatography. And then you have a, uh, basic heal a BHLH, a basic helix loop, loop helix, a cold coil, and a zinc finger as motifs that bind to the DNA. So that's all I want to cover for today. Next time we'll, we'll be going fishing. <laughs>